Well, good afternoon uh, to all our alumni who could join us this today. Uh, perhaps good morning to a few that might be on the other side of the world. Uh, but we're thrilled that you could be with us for this first of what will be a series of webinars for TFAS alumni throughout the world. Uh, I'm so pleased that we're kicking it off today with a very special guest, Ambassador Paula Dobriansky. Uh, Paula is a member of our Board of Trustees, uh, but is also a foreign policy expert and a diplomat who has specialized in national security affairs, particularly uh, specialty, uh, not only with many of those topics in that category, but also with the part of the world we're focused on in this webinar. She, Paula Dobriansky is a fellow at Harvard's JFK Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and vice chair of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. Ambassador Dobriansky brings 30 years of government and international experience across senior levels of diplomacy, business, and national defense. Just to give you a little background before we begin with questions, uh, from uh, 2010 to 2012, Ambassador Dobriansky was Senior Vice President and Global Head of Government and Regulatory Affairs at Thomson Reuters. At that same time, she was a Distinguished National Security Chair at the U.S. Naval Academy. Ambassador Dobriansky served as Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs from 2001 to 2009. Uh, notably, in 2007, she served as the President's Envoy to Northern Ireland. Ambassador Dobriansky received the Secretary of State's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal, for her contribution to the historic devolution of power to Belfast. She has held many Senate confirmed and senior level positions in the US government, including Director of European and Soviet Affairs at the National Security Council. Uh, uh, Ambassador Dobransky received her BSFS at summa cum laude at Georgetown University in the School of Foreign Service and her master's and PhD at Harvard University. She's been recognized by many governments with their highest honors of merit, including the governments of Poland, Hungary, Romania, and Lithuania. And she's received many honorary degrees. Well, that's just part of her background, but that's enough, or we won't have any time for some questions. Uh, I do uh, want to mention to all of you that you're welcome to put questions in the Q&A. We'll try to get to as many of those as possible uh, this morning uh, in our limited amount of time. But uh, I'll just start with a few to get the discussion going uh, on this very important topic. Uh, Ambassador Dobriansky, Russia invaded Ukraine on February 25th, and that's nearly 75 days ago now. Uh, this followed several years of conflict uh, in Eastern Ukraine and meddling uh, by Russia. Could you help us understand what's at stake in the conflict and why, if at all, Americans should care about the Russian invasion. Uh, from, from your perspective, what are the geopolitical consequences of the war? Roger, first, uh, thank you very much for that warm introduction. And before I go to the question, if I may, I do just want to first congratulate the Fund for American Studies for all the work that it does and has done and will do. And I also want to say that I happen to come from a rather vigorous TFAS family. My father, if I may say, as you know, Ambassador Lev Dobriansky and Professor Dr. Lev Dobriansky, he founded and directed the Institute on Comparative Political and Economic Systems. And he also taught uh, within the Institute. Um, uh, also, I want to say we're very appreciative. The fact that you hold every year the annual Lev Dobriansky lecture, which occurs over the summer. Um, and I also want to mention that my sister 
also was uh, uh, someone who uh, did attend the institute, and you mentioned I'm on the on the on the board. So we are genuinely a TFAS supported family, mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. I, I didn't mention my mother, but my my mother had a say in everything. So <laughs> that's how she got engaged. And at least for those who mm-hmm. knew her, uh, they would certainly say that was absolutely true. Um, so let me say um, again, thank you. Um, to go to the question uh, which you asked, which is basically and fundamentally, you know, why should at least the bottom line was you said, why should Americans care about this? And also, what are the geopolitical consequences of the of this of this war? Um, the fact is, first, that Ukraine is of ge- geostrategic importance. It holds a position uh, 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 strategically within uh, the space between Europe and, if you will, into Asia. Uh, and itself uh, is a, a country that is well endowed with resources, um, not just agriculturally, but also in terms of, of minerals uh, uh, itself. Secondly, so the geostrategic importance, but secondly, the fact is that we should care about this because Americans have always identified with uh, support of law and legal frameworks. We have signed many conventions, protocols, uh, uh, in which there are codes of conduct, codes of conduct to resolve issues, codes of conduct and where you don't resort to blatant outright war and aggression. And in that sense, I think Americans have demonstrated that they care deeply about what's happening because this was an unprovoked war, an outright blatant aggression, and we're witnessing a massacre of the Ukrainian people. So here, there's been an outright violation and abrogation of international law, including the Budapest Memorandum, which the United States, uh, Russia, Ukraine, and the UK signed, and in which Ukraine faithfully gave up its nuclear weapons in return for the protection of its territorial integrity and sovereignty. And look at what has happened. You asked what are geopolitical consequences here? By the way, we should also care about it. The fact that the Budapest Memorandum has been violated uh, also sends a signal to other, others around the globe, like Iran, like North Korea, who, by the way, will point to and say, well, look at Ukraine. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons and look what happened to it. They will use that argument to defend their own advancement and usage of and desire to use nuclear weapons. And then let me just also say that strategically, this situation matters greatly because what unfolds in Ukraine, how we deal with Ukraine sends a signal to others across the globe. There's been great concern about China and whether China will actually take a military, outright military action against Taiwan. Um, And there are others that could be named. So it does matter in terms of all the reasons I've mentioned. And I think there's been a manifestation, not just from our government, but from the outpouring of support across the United States, particularly because it's also a humanitarian crisis. Innocent children, women, uh, young men, are, are across the board are being massacred, uh, taken out uh, uh, randomly, and it's a scorched earth uh, uh, approach uh, here, and it's it's unjustified and it's outrageous in this day and age. Well, you've you've laid that out very well, and uh, I uh, have, have I know I know from personal experience that uh, you know if you try to order a, a flag of Ukraine or. Uh, lapel buttons from Ukraine, they're on back order because I think Americans have been ordering them and flying them. There are three or four Ukra- Ukrainian flags flying on my street here in Northern Virginia. So I think there is a lot of uh, concern in that humanitarian crisis. We know TFAS alums, both Americans and others in Europe who've gone to Poland, gone to the border there, even gone into Ukraine to try to help uh, with people who are fleeing the violence. Uh, and we'll, we'll touch on, we'll get back to your father as well, but let me first ask, uh, I'm glad you, you mentioned him right at the opening there. Uh, for, first, I'll just remind everyone that please put questions in the Q&A. Uh, Jen Stanglin will uh, handle them in a little bit, but if you can, put your name with the question and maybe where you're from, because that might be interesting for us to know. 
Uh, I'd appreciate that. If you want it to be anonymous, it can be, but otherwise, please put your name with the question. Well, uh, it, certainly the invasion has seemed at least to strengthen the NATO alliance and unified the European community in ways that hadn't been as unified in the past. Uh, at the same time, you know, there's been some reluctance, uh, certainly in the US, to do more than supply equipment and financial aid. Uh, should we take further steps? And what are the risks if we do? Well, we should be taking a lot of further steps. But let me go back to the point you made about where, where we've been a bit. Uh, there are two issues. Last year, I signed a statement that was drawn up by the Atlantic Council. It brought together Republicans, Democrats, independents, and basically it called upon the administration then to uh, take action to deter Russia from invading Ukraine. The action that we put forth was military action, the deployment of our, our forces, uh, and when I say our forces, NATO forces, it didn't have to be US troops, but NATO forces on the, the, the border area to show a show of force and unity of purpose, uh, to also take other kinds of military action, as well as economic sanctions. Um, in the end, there was a difference, I would say, over the term deterrence. Why? Because we felt to deter an invasion, you have to show demonstrable action. You can't just say what you're going to do, but you have to do it. The administration opted and said that these are the things we're going to do uh, if there's an invasion. Well, February 24, as we know, there was indeed an invasion. And so uh, then we get into the question about escalation. And what do you give? How do you give it? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So towards that end, also I would say that I think what you asked, what next steps? Back then and now, President Zelensky has been very clear about the kind of military equipment that's needed to fight this war and to win. They needed heavy artillery. They need drones. They need tanks. They need surface-to-air missiles, surface-to-air missile systems. They need aircraft. These are all the kinds of systems that they have called for very, very clearly. Uh, in that regard, I'd say there's been this issue of what do you give and is there an escalation? The fact is that Putin has said, as have some of his uh, circle, have said that if you give military aid, it's an act of war. We already are in war here. So the fact is that we should be going and giving as much aid and assistance as possible quickly in a timely fashion and to enable Ukraine and the Ukrainian military to fight this war capably and to win it. So what are the kinds of things that are needed? Time has to be fast decisiveness in terms of those kinds of systems that they have asked for on the ground that are crucial. And thirdly, I would say to you that, you know, it's striking to me here in next steps, it's total support for the Ukrainian military. Why? Because by the way, they've already shown and demonstrated how resourceful they've been. And when they were underestimated, and I think that Moscow, Putin, not only underestimated uh, the Ukrainian military, but I also think they underestimated the unity of the West. And that was another part of your question. Yes, we have also witnessed where not just the United States, but NATO allies, other countries like Australia, like Japan, have stepped forward, have provided not only military assistance, but also have taken specific economic uh, actions through sanctions that will also cripple the funding of Russia's war machine. So clearly we could have done much, much more to send that signal to Putin that we wouldn't tolerate a further incursion in, in Ukraine. Uh, you've made that clear with what you just said. Uh, looking a little bit in hindsight at US policy over the past decade or more, uh, you know, are there, other actions than those you mentioned in the past year that we should have been taking in the past, or alternatively, you know, there are those who would say uh, we shouldn't have expanded NATO. 
that that led to this point. But I love your appreciate your thoughts on that. No, uh, a strong defense is the biggest deterrent. And as President Ronald Reagan had said, we must go for peace through strength. And here, having uh, not only a vibrant, strong economy, but a strong defense, that is in of itself a deterrent. I would say there were several factors that led us up to this point. Let me start with the fact that in 2005, Putin made the statement about the greatest tragedy, uh, by the way, uh, of uh, that century was the breakup of the, of the Soviet Union. Um, and secondly, was then when he said in 2007, his speech before the Munich Security Conference, he said it very clearly. United States is a unipolar uh, 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 power. We do not want to see them as a unipolar power. Russia has targeted the United States, our global influence, and has sought to deteriorate it and to get it uh, 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 less influence, if not eliminate it. Uh, on the same speech, he also called for no NATO enlargement. He also called for, we can, Russia, we can invade and intervene anywhere Russian ethnics are, are, uh, are jeopardized. He's used that as a false excuse for in number of cases coming in and invading. And it's false, it's totally not true, not the case. And certainly in the case of, 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 of Ukraine. And then he also uh, indicated that Western values are not Russia's values. I would say that here we should have taken action and we did not take the kind of strong action Russia felt it could get away when we had the, uh, the, the onslaught in Brozny and Chechnya, when we witnessed in 2008, the invasion of Georgia, and then the occupation of Ossetia, and then in Ukraine itself, and back in 2014, uh, that was a harbinger of things to come, the illegal annexation of Crimea, and then also the occupation of Donetsk, and uh, Luhansk and the Donbass region. And then also the indication that they wanted Mariupol. Mariupol is key because it is a land bridge into Crimea. And so there were a number of signals that one could say that during those periods, basically Putin's calculation was, I take these actions, uh, there's some sanctions imposed, and then it's business as usual. And there can't be business as usual. And this time there was a miscalculation, and I think it was miscalculated because of Afghanistan, the fact of the withdrawal from Afghanistan. We uh, looked like we were withdrawing from the international scene, no less our presence in the region. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was also a belief that at home, the United States is divided. And also, I think there was a belief on the part of Putin that Europe, in terms of the transatlantic alliance, that it's fragmented. Each are going in its own way. Look at the energy space. All of these countries, you know, oil, gas, gas in particular with Europe, they're dependent on us. And this is the leverage that we will use. They, they will look at more their, their, their economies and business as usual. And if I could also, uh, Roger, insert here, if I may, uh, and that is, I think we had many missed signals uh, here up to this point, but I'm going to also insert about my father. My father has a, written a book, he's deceased, but it will be forthcoming. It focuses on a vindication, a vindication of a resolution he put forward and a framework of the Captive Nations Week resolution back in 1959, 1959, which has relevance up to the present, and a vindication because specifically uh, uh, the Captive Nations Week resolution, basically it, 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 it focused on how the Soviet Union <laughs> uh, that which Putin wants to recreate, by the way, in fact, was a prison, a prison of nations uh, that was so inimical to the very um, uh, 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 human spirit uh, and, 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 and kind of, of, of yearning of people who want self-governance and also would not tolerate a, 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 a kind of suppression and repression of their freedom. So here, I do want to put that in this mix because I think there were many signals. There were many who argued. 
My father argued that uh, incessantly uh, in terms of what not only the Soviet Union, but Russian imperialism is about, and we're witnessing that, in fact, today. Yeah, well, I, I assume that there are a number of alumni on, on this webinar today who are older alumni like myself who had the opportunity to attend a summer institute when your father was the director. Uh, and, and it was interesting because Professor Lev Dobryansky, a distinguished professor in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, gave one lecture that summer to us. Uh, he wasn't a regular faculty member in our program, but I, I well remember that lecture among, you know, hearing Dr. Walter Judd that summer, and we heard um, Ambassador Pearl Bailey, uh, who not only spoke to us about her work at the UN, but also saying hello, Dolly, to us. <laughs> but, but your father's lecture stuck with me because he, he really, at that time, you know, there was a tendency, I think, for Americans, particularly younger Americans, to just think of the Soviet Union as one large block of people. And he made clear to us that you needed to understand the Soviet Union was made up of distinct republics, um, many of which are all, you know, had been countries at one point, uh, that Ukraine and Russia were very distinct. And uh, Putin seems to try to be changing history when it comes to that relationship between Ukraine and Russia and claim that it was somehow a gift from the Tsar to, to Russia. But I, I was going to ask you what your father would think about if he were alive today, because he, he's done so much work on captive nations and getting a memorial to the victims of communism and to see this happening in 2022, something we never imagined would happen. Uh, I look forward to the, reading that book, but you I, know, you know I other think, thoughts about what he would well, think? I do. I, I think he would say three things. First of all, I think he would feel as uh, the, if you will, the, the, the title of his forthcoming book on vindication of, of, of this trail, um, in which he spotlights the Captive Nations Week resolution and as a kind of framework. Uh, that called literally uh, what we witnessed, the tyranny, uh, uh, the, uh, to use that term, whether it was quote unquote Soviet communism, it was Russian communism tyranny, and the total disregard for those nations, those nations that were captive and being held captive as a part of the so-called Soviet Union. Um, so in this case, I think he would A, feel vindicated, Secondly, I think he would cite the fact that there are those who have underestimated Ukraine. And as I said in my earlier comments, yeah. uh, Putin definitely underestimated not only Ukraine's fighting spirit, but the way in which it has, has been resourceful, resourceful. Uh, while there was this uh, uh, delay from the West in, in terms of its assistance, it's been resourceful, it's been capable of moving forward and in ways that took the Russian military by surprise. And also that was a surprise, the way the Russian military has been failing on the battlefield. And I also think, uh, thirdly, I think uh, my father would be very, very proud of, uh, of uh, President Zelensky. Uh, uh, the kind of leadership that he has shown the kind of appeal that he has made broadly to all parts of the world. I was in Doha, Qatar, and he spoke to, I mean, a, a, you know, thousands of people who were gathered for the Doha forum there. Uh, he has reached out and reached out in ways not only calling for support for Ukraine in the sense of military support, economic sanctions, but he has also uh, indicated the kind of human tragedy that's also taking place on the ground and the dire need for assistance there. And, and, and he reminds all of us that there were and there are legal protocols that should not have been violated and certainly not in this day and age. So uh, I'd start with my father would not want to see this happen to Ukraine, but I think he would be proud of the kind of resistance, the kind of leadership, the kind of forcefulness that's being manifested here. And at the same time, he certainly would be vindicated for those that said he was totally wrong, 
that we would never see the dismantlement of the Soviet Union, which he predicted. And he basically said that if you look at the fact that it is comprised of these captive nations, that their desire for freedom, for self-governance, that ultimately that the Soviet Union was a very fragile, fragile entity, false entity unto itself. Well, uh, the Fund for American Studies mission is that of developing courageous leaders with a commitment to self-government and and uh, American the, the values of a democratic free society. And so I'm glad you mentioned President Zelensky. He's, he's been almost Churchillian in his leadership. It's been really remarkable under the types of wartime conditions he's faced. Uh, but let me shift a little and say, you know, if, if by some stroke of luck and heart, you know, not luck, but uh, bravery, uh, the war ends very soon. What do you think the United States and the international community need to think about in terms of an on the ongoing humanitarian crisis that this has created there? Well, uh, what, whether the war ends or not, I guess, you know, how do we the, deal with this? There, there is a major humanitarian crisis uh, that is afoot. And if you don't mind, I want to go back to 2014 because it didn't get the attention that it should have gotten then. But when Russia illegally annexed Crimea and it invaded and occupied the Donbass region, Donetsk, Luhansk, all of that, that area, there were close to almost 2 million Ukrainians who were displaced, who were literally homeless, jobless. So by the way, let me just add to this mix. We are now getting a spotlight because of the war and the march towards uh, Kiev, the march towards Odessa, the march uh, you know, in Ukraine in its entirety that there's been a spotlight about all the women, children, you know, those who have been fleeing. But I want to add, Roger, there has been a crisis that yeah, existed in Ukraine during this time. And you know, it wasn't getting the kind of support that it should have gotten actually uh, during this period. There were the Minsk discussions and Normandy discussions and constant discussions about what happens with that Donbass region. And uh, uh, I would say that I never saw a seriousness of purpose emanating from, from Russia, uh, from Moscow. Uh, these were delayed. And it was like there was a strong desire, like in Georgia, for example, to leave the region in kind of abeyance to leave it in a gray zone where there's a hardship and a drain on society. So you asked, uh, what about this situation? It's massive. I mean, the figures in terms of the outflow, I believe that there have been figures that have ranged in terms of the outflow of now refugees, I believe is between 11 to 13 million. It's, 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 it's daunting. And by the way, it's also daunting the massacre that we see on building structures, infrastructure in Ukraine, and uh, a no less disrupted supply chains. But back to the humanitarian crisis, I will say one can be gratified by the fact that the United States has stepped up. And I'm not speaking of just you know, our US government saying we will accept refugees. There have been so many volunteers. There's an organization, welcome.us. To any of our alum, look at that. Welcome.us is phenomenal. John Bridgeland and his team are leading that. They did it with Afghanistan. They're doing it now with Ukraine. They're looking to families to volunteer to bring in homeless Ukrainians and young Ukrainians so their lives won't be so disrupted uh, by what took place. It's hard for me to say that. And then also, I, I have to say that uh, Europe has also stepped forward. The Czech foreign minister was here. Uh, uh, recently, uh, 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 and I have to say, I was very gratified to hear about what they're doing and many other countries. So it's daunting. Poland, Poland has done phenomenally in terms of uh, assisting and helping uh, uh, Ukrainians uh, at this time of need. So the crisis is, is a severe one, uh, certainly relative to uh, those refugees. It's a severe one in terms of uh, Ukraine itself being raised to the ground, its infrastructure being destroyed, and homes. 
And then it's on top of already what took place in 2014. And then let me add one more. By the way, what's happening has ramifications globally in terms of a humanitarian crisis, particularly the continent of Africa. Egypt, for example, relies about 75 to 80 percent on getting Ukraine's grain and wheat that has not been able to get through. And also Russia wants to seize Odessa. It's an important point, uh, port for Ukraine and for its exports. Here, countries like Egypt, other countries need that kind of assistance in terms of, of getting basic commodities, in terms of food and food supplies and where they are reliant on Ukraine and Ukraine's infrastructure. So it's not just only about Ukrainian people, it's about how it's impacting Europe. It's how it's impacting other regions like Africa, for example, and no less, it also has an impact on us. Well, thank you. Uh, I, think, I think we'll shift to questions from uh, our alumni. I will uh, mention that uh, since you mentioned the Czech foreign minister, we're, we've been very proud of uh, alumni we've heard from who are over there uh, working on this, as well as donors of ours who have gone to Poland, especially, and uh, people who are raising money and sending money. Uh, but also, I wanted to mention, since these are the circles you travel in, Ambassador Dobryansky, that the permanent representative representatives to the UN from the Czech Republic and Poland are TFAS alums, as is the Deputy Foreign Minister of the Czech Republic, who is uh, their uh, representative to the EU. And uh, so we've got alums in, in official capacities and working through civil society to try to have a positive impact on things. But you've laid out really the, the challenges and the, the heartbreaking situation that exists because of this invasion. Well, Roger, may I just inject this fast? You should be very proud of that in terms of, you mentioned the, the, the checks. I was very struck that during their visit in the delegation, I was very, very uh, uh, struck and heartened by not only their security concerns, but the humanitarian outpouring, the degree to which they and other countries in the region in Central Europe are stepping forward, Poland, to try to avert this crisis and to do what is needed to help the Ukrainian people. It's, 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 yeah. it's, it's really significant. Yeah, well, well, Jen, uh, I'll let you uh, bring, I see we have a lot of questions, so let's get to as many as we can. So Paul, Paul you have to- Try to have pithier answer. answers, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we, we do indeed, thank you, Roger, and thank you, Ambassador Dobriansky. Um, what you've said thus far has been enlightening. Uh, our first question comes from Mari Yogala from Estonia. She asks, uh, what do you see the future de-escalation of the situation looking like? What are the preconditions that Russia needs to meet? And does there have to be a clear shift of the country's leadership and regime? Uh, on the first, in terms of a de-escalation and what's going to happen, I think first and foremost, we have to see what will happen on the battlefield. Uh, clearly the discussions, the talks, the, if you will, the peace talks, negotiations, they're not, they're not gonna be driven in isolation. It is going to depend on what happens on the battlefield. So that's why I emphasize the importance of getting military aid and assistance to Ukraine so Ukraine can uh, preserve and push back the Russian onslaught and preserve its territory and its uh, uh, sovereignty, its territorial integrity. Uh, I think your second part of that, because it was a three-part question, sorry, Jen, the second part yeah. was... Let me, let me reread that. What are the preconditions that Russia needs to meet? And then does there need to be a clear shift of the country? The, pre, the, uh, the precondition, the Russians have put forth uh, four uh, demands. They said that uh, Luhansk and Donetsk have to be declared independent republics. That's Ukrainian territory, by the way. They say that Crimea has to be uh, 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 Russia, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Russian. And in this case, as you know, uh, Crimea was illegally annexed by Russia in 2014. They also demand a complete demilitarization of Ukraine. 
Uh, that's rather unacceptable when you think about how Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons and here a uh, demilitarization of Ukraine. Uh, when uh, there's a dire need for Ukraine to have assurances and absolute guarantees, you know, at the end of this, that its territory and, and sovereignty will be protected. Uh, and then the fourth is uh, the uh, condition about demilitar, uh, uh, well, I said demilitarization, that Ukraine not go into NATO and that it codify that it not enter NATO in its constitution. I like the fact uh, that you're Estonia, you're right up by Finland. The Finnish president gave a speech and he said, no country, no country has a right to tell another country what alliance it can be part of or not. And as we're witnessing in Finland and the move towards NATO and NATO membership. But those are the terms that Russia has put forward. They are unacceptable. On the Ukrainian side, the Ukrainians have said, President Zelensky said, we will not join NATO at this time, uh, 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 you know, that they're not joining NATO and they would take a neutrality. But uh, let, me, let me say that these other issues that Russia put forward are unacceptable. What will happen next, in my view, is going to be determined on the battlefield. And finally, you did ask about leadership. I assume you weren't speaking about Ukrainian leadership because there's been tremendous leadership. The Russian leadership uh, here, uh, I think there have been many, many who have spoken about the kind of war crimes that have taken place and how they have to be atoned for. Thank you. We have our next question from Matthew Mortensen, who's a political science major at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. He asks, would you expect surrounding allied countries to further become active military players, um, i.e. troops on the ground within this invasion uh, if they haven't already? And if so, which ones would you expect? I, I don't see that uh, uh, NATO, there's been a declaration from Stoltenberg, and I haven't seen that uh, the surrounding countries have uh, stated that they would put troops into Ukraine. Any troops or, or military assistance has been voluntary by those who want to volunteer to join in with Ukrainian forces. But I will say that Poland, for example, has pushed hard for forward deployment of troops at the border as a deterrent. And there have been clear declarations that if any country, any NATO country uh, is impacted, that uh, then uh, 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 NATO will in fact react. As you know, there's uh, Article 5, which says one NATO country impacted uh, uh, and attacked, then that's an attack on all. But at this time, NATO and these countries have given invaluable, invaluable assistance, uh, not only in terms of humanitarian, uh, which was Roger's last question, but certainly absolutely in terms of military assistance, which has been very crucial at this time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that leads nicely into our next question from Andrew Broker in Indianapolis. He says, my concern is the additional possible incursions into the Baltic states if we do not stop um, Putin here. Would NATO support and help defend the Baltic states if Russia did indeed threaten them? My answer to that question is uh, if uh, Estonia, Latvia, or Lithuania, in fact, are attacked, uh, the answer is 100%. We are part of NATO. NATO has Article 5. Attack on one is an attack on all. I had the privilege, by the way, when I was in Doha of interviewing the three Baltic presidents. I have to say that uh, they're very strong. Uh, the unity is strong. And you know, this is of great concern. We have to be concerned about what steps would be taken. So again, uh, I answered your question, but let me lead it further. It, we cannot let Ukraine be defeated because that will have ramifications for the neighborhood. And we, mm -hmm. we, we, the independence of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania have to be sustained. And we must preserve, of course, the NATO code of conduct, which is Article 5. And finally, you didn't ask this, but I am going to stick in Moldova, because Moldova also at this time is uh, being threatened. 
And uh, it is also a country that uh, uh, we must be concerned about in terms of any kind of Russian invasion. Mm. Thank you. I think we have time for a few more. Um, Mio, uh, a TIFAS alumnus from Burma or Myanmar, asks this question. Uh, several news media outlets suggest Putin's senior advisors are too afraid to tell him the truth. Some even suggest that he feels misled by the Russian military. What are your opinions on such observations? And in your opinion, how much information um, is or how much of the information that Putin is receiving from his inner circle true? The only information that I really have is uh, based on uh, reports that come from uh, 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 a wide variety of, if you will, sources. But you know, you only know what you know if you were there on the scene. And in this case, uh, the one telltale sign is, it does strike me two things. When we saw video clips of Putin meeting with his, uh, 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 you know, whether it's his defense minister uh, or, uh, or foreign minister among other officials when there were photo shots of it. If you noticed, they were placed quite a distance from Putin on this long, long table. That conveyed one message, at least uh, as to why, uh, maybe the concern about whether or not there is loyalty there because uh, of the distance. But secondly, you know, when you look at the faces and the, the, the photo shot that scanned across all of the, the aides, no one looked, you know, I think everyone looked like they were, were, were not prepared to say anything. Mm. So you have to decide for yourself, but it seems to me there are certainly reports that have said this and there are visuals that seem to substantiate it. Mm. It's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Alex Wells from Erie, Pennsylvania asks, will you entice Putin with any off ramps or concessions in order to put an end to the humanitarian crisis? Or on the other hand, would you commit to a maximum pressure campaign a la Iran? I, I, don't, I, I, I don't see any uh, off ramps, but you know, we have to be guided by Ukraine. Uh, it's Ukraine and the Ukrainian leadership here uh, uh, in terms of what they think is appropriate. But I said earlier that the, this, any negotiation is going to be derived from what happens on the battlefield. And when President Zelensky or his foreign minister have spoken, they've emphasized the urgent need for armament and supplies and for being able to sustain and to fight a strong fight. So that will, I think, determine terms as one goes forward uh, here. But I, I, as for coming forward at this juncture with any kind of arbitrary off ramps, I don't see it. When you see a massacre taking place, you know, again, you, 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 and the fight, the very courageous fight that the Ukrainians are waging here, uh, despite the kinds of losses that they're being incurred, that to me speaks volumes, volumes. That to me is where we get our guidance from. They're the ones fighting this war and they have indicated that this is what they are looking for. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, this might be our last question. Um, from John Tolviste, uh, the question reads, for the past 30 years, we've considered Russia and the Russian people as being in transition in terms of rule of law, civil rights, values, etc. It now seems that there was no transition, um, not even possibly in the younger generations in Russia. So when this war is over, will we again think of Russia as being in transition or will that thinking have changed? Well, I would go back to first, you mentioned the issue of transition. And on the issue of transition, I think regrettably, I don't think that we ever witnessed a full-fledged transition uh, in the sense of uh, the embracement of uh, freedom, a free press, uh, and embracement of free and fair elections. Uh, we saw, and let me give one example, we saw 
one of the contenders who was a deputy um, uh, a prime, uh, prime minister, uh, Nemtsov, who was murdered at the Kremlin, uh, right by the Kremlin. Did you know that he was murdered the day before he was going to release a report in Russian codifying all the atrocities that had taken place and the Russian loss of life, no less Ukrainian loss of life, in the 2014 Russian incursion in Crimea and in Donbass, and he was murdered. So I, I would have to take a little bit exception as to whether we ever saw a full-fledged transition. We didn't. That's why I referred to my father earlier and the term captive nation. We haven't seen that the people of Russia have gotten what they deserve in the sense of self-governance in terms of basic fundamental freedoms and also respect for their religion, for their nationality. And that's hence captive nations, all of those were captive. And you know, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all were captive and your independence was taken away, Moscow. So in this case, we, I would want to see a transition. That's what we would hope for, certainly here. And that's what we push for. And I'll end on this note. That's why I think it's so crucial to support uh, uh, the Ukrainian military in this fight, because that's what they are fighting for. They're fighting for their freedom, for their independence, and it's not just for them. Zelensky has said it over and over. It is for all those nations who want to have freedom. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, uh, 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 Moldova, I could go on. Uh, and no less, Russia itself deserves self-governance and freedom, which it has not had the benefit of having. Mm. Thank you, Ambassador. And thank you to all of our alumni who submitted fantastic questions. I'll turn it back over to Roger to end our time. Thank you, Jen. Uh, we didn't quite get to all the questions, but many of those we didn't get to were touched on in the questions we did answer. Uh, so thank you very much for, for your questions today. Uh, this has been great, very, very enlightening. And I uh, appreciate Ambassador Dobransky, your time. I, I think you did mention before the call started that you're giving three speeches today, which is which is wonderful that you're you're able to get out uh, to different audiences to talk about what is happening and what the U.S. needs to be doing. So we're delighted to have you with you. You honor your father uh, with your work, and uh, that means a lot to us at the Fund for American Studies because of the pivotal role he played in this organization for many years. Uh, for alumni who come to Washington, please visit us at our office. You'll see a portrait of Professor Lev Dobriansky hanging on our wall. And uh, I get to walk by that every day on my way to my office. So thank you so much. Thank you, Roger. And I just want to say in closing, it was a real honor and privilege. And as I said, you have a Dobriansky family that was absolutely committed to the Fund for American Studies. So it was an honor for me indeed to be here today with the alum. Thank you.